This is the Healthcare Marketplace Specialization, Healthcare Marketplace Overview. I'm Steve Prenti, and this is Module 4.3.3, Pharma and Device Convergence. So we've talked a lot about what will happen in the medical device space and the pharma space in terms of getting technologies approved and covered. One of the things to keep in mind is that there is a thought that there will be a convergence, really, within these two industries. And uh, we actually see it um, quite a bit. Uh, across the globe, and not just in the U.S., we frequently find it's the same regulators looking at these drugs and or devices. Um, they will have the same uh, insurance uh, revenues. Um, medical devices are starting um, to cross this metabolizing threshold. So, for example, um, there are what's known as uh, bare metal stents, which, if you've never seen a stent before, it's essentially a, a metal mesh that uh, goes into an artery and it expands to actually hold back um, the blockage that might have been in that artery once it's been cleaned um, through a balloon angioplasty. And when that actually expands out there, the bare metal stent will hold it back. There was technology developed called a drug eluding bare metal stent, meaning you're coating the actual uh, metal with a drug substance. And so the thought is that that will keep essentially uh, the plaque buildup down. Now, there's been clinical this uh, study showing that that may not be as effective as people thought given the additional cost, but it illustrates how essentially a drug designed to metabolize uh, will be part of a medical device. So there is a pipeline uh, that pharma has and thought is that there's going to be increased convergence where devices that will enable drugs and vice versa could become a brand new product line that needs to be thought of in this concept of convergence. So um, is it really happening? Um, there are limitations to convergence. Um, it may encourage less innovation uh, with the possible reduction of small firms that aren't able to fund FDA trials. Keep in mind, we talked about how clinical trials with drugs are extremely expensive, and you still have to reach that barrier of getting to the class three uh, clinical trial, which is a lot of money. And so... Uh, to have a device company be able to do that could be very challenging and would really require essentially a device company and pharma to work more hand-in-hand. -hand. There's the issue of new technologies that can make old approaches extinct and capsize both industries. So, for example, a genomic research project of a powerful gene theory uh, might really do in a set of implantable devices that basically says, you know, if we actually change the gene structure, uh, we don't really have to worry as much about some of the things that we're surgically trying to deal with inside the heart. Uh, a bit little science fiction, but maybe not so implausible in the future, particularly if we're looking at, say, uh, prenatal technology. Is convergence coming, again, between these two things? The benefits of convergence is that PBMs, or we know as pharmaceutical benefit managers, which monitor things for health insurers, have a national IT infrastructure. And that's that group actually has the data to make that Medtronic Vision 2010 case work really well, if there was a more balanced approach to FDA uh, requirements, that is, they consider uh, essentially the convergence technologies more uniformly, uh, it could actually work fairly well. People are concerned about a pharma bubble that may occur from a lot of uh, acquisitions that are going on right now, and this might be something to mitigate that if the technologies are a little more balanced uh, in their portfolio. So in summary for convergence, there's a lot of market opportunities out there for medical technology. And actually beyond just convergence, um, with this opportunity across this whole med technology market, there is a lot of risk. Um, there are increasingly prescriptive requirements that manufacturers must meet uh, for FDA approval, and not just FDA, but across all of the global uh, regulatory bodies. And they have to basically use certain uh, re uh, analytic criteria for their submissions for their drugs, which are for formularies. They have to think about what the comparative treatment effects are going to be for technologies. They're going to have to worry about reevaluations of their technologies as new products come online and compare them to old. All of these things are part of the risk portfolio, but it's a billion-dollar enterprise. And if you get a blockbuster, it's really amazing. Manufacturers must recognize that all claims are potentially discoverable, and they need to take a consistent global approach to clinical assessment which will minimize adverse assessments or false or misleading claims. What is encouraging is that many manufacturers now are uh, buying essentially firms across oceans to, I think, actually mitigate this risk, not just for 
the tax shielding aspect of, say, these inversions that different companies have done, but also actually sharing some of the R&D that's across both countries and the regulatory um, har harmonies, if you will, between the two and their staffs that go on there. And as future consumers, honestly, we don't want anything else. We want to have the best technologies that are not going to bankrupt our systems, but are going to allow us to get not just more years on our life clock, but really quality years on our life clock. To make that extra five years and that technological gamble that we talked about before really worth it and not just something where you're just lying in a bed. And this concludes our whole segment on medical technology and pharma as well as the device industry.